Now take a look at science from a different point of view as Jeff Goldblum hosts Future Quest. Stay with us. Thanks to our members and the following for supporting KCET's programming today. At the KCET Store of Knowledge, you'll find thousands of things to play with and explore. Entertain your brain. Santa Monica Place, Glendale Galleria, Fashion Island, and Montclair Plaza. We've come to a Caribbean island whose only inhabitants are monkeys. To ask the question, what can they teach us about ourselves? When is it useful to smile a lot? Is peacemaking the basis of morality? And how do we learn to use tools? I'm Alan Alden. Join me next time for Primetime Primates. Don't play it's too hard. It's primarily primates, Wednesday at 8 on KCET. Hello, my name is Bob Sharp. As a teacher, I have used public television as an effective teaching tool. For instance, we were studying the architectures and held up a picture from a book but this show demonstrated each step of the process, and I can assure you the students were excited about learning, which spells success for any teacher. Programs like Storytime and the Magic School Bus also help make learning an exciting experience. I think it needs to continue. If you are concerned about cuts in federal funding for this valuable, commercial-free, educational resource, please write your congressional representative today. A report from the Republican Revolution in Washington. We interviewed Democratic Senator Barbara Boxer Tuesday night at 7.30 here on Life and Times. Future Quest is made possible by AT&T, a proud supporter of public television. Have you ever renewed your driver's license? At a cash machine? You will. And the company that will bring it to you? AT&T. This program is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. I'm ready for my future now, Mr. DeVille. fact is, it's getting harder and harder to remember when computers weren't every place doing work we used to do. So what are these things, computers? Are they smarter than we are? Are they becoming our new best friends? In the future, will computers remain our co-workers? Or will they take control and become our bosses? I mean, computers are just machines, aren't they? there is a fascination with uh, computer technology at the moment. This is my computer right here. This is like, you see it closed, beeps when you close it. This is my computer, a uh, Toshiba color monitor, 150 megabytes. I mean, I think there's a national obsession with it. Yes, I do write on the computer, but only on the top of it with a pen, because I don't know how to open it. It's, it's beyond mania. It's become um, a fetish. I have a wireless modem as well, a uh, radio modem. I use once in a while. Modem? 
Oh, I don't know. I, I, I guess I have a moment. What is, is that? A, I don't even know what that is. See, I'm very, I get very squeamish. I don't like to know what the inners are of anything. Several of my books are being put on CD-ROMs now, and I don't even know what the hell that means. Is I just want the money. <laughs> People kept saying, if machines ever learn to play chess, then they'll be intelligent. Well, they do play chess now. They said, well, when machines can learn how to recognize human speech, then they'll be intelligent. Well, they do recognize human speech now. Good morning, Charlie. Good morning, Frank. And we're continuing to come up with ways to differentiate our intelligence from the machines we've done. And you know something? We're running out of room to dance. Our technology is becoming us to a huge degree. We're going to begin to ask ourselves the question, what is it to be a human being? And it's going to be something separate from what the machine can do, from what the computer can do. Some people just sort of disappear head first into their computers. You see the soles of their feet go in, and you don't see them again for weeks or months. If, if you asked me to, to give up my computing elements and the network and all of that, I, I just couldn't function. sort of this seductive, almost addictive thing, getting involved in the computer world. And it's not entirely a positive thing. I can be away from my computer for hours at a time, but uh, it doesn't seem I can go for a full uh, day. Technology is becoming mainstream, but at the same time, it's becoming, it's being designed in such a way so that the humans don't necessarily have to go to engineering school or get computer science degrees. It's becoming much easier to use, and therefore it's becoming much more mainstream. We've been mesmerized by the promise of computerized utopia. They used to say that we'd have this one big computer running the whole house and you'd sit there and you'd program in everything about your life and then this one could push one button and it would run your whole life. But the way it really works, we have all these little chips and every appliance has its own chip and you program each thing separately and it makes more sense that way and you have much more flexibility and much more control. Computers are very good at coming up with new ways of modeling and experiencing portions of reality that you can't experience directly on your senses. They can imitate television, they can imitate books, they can imitate music. Their whole content is about simulating things from descriptions. I think that now everybody is going to have to be computer literate. It, it, it will be almost as bad as not knowing how to read and write in the next three or four years if you can't use a computer. I suppose I am a computer-resistant person. I never really thought of it in a phrase like that before. I never really thought of it as like a, a syndrome or me needing to go to some sort of a support group, but uh, some feelings are coming up now. In the sense, that, the same sense that Henry Ford's car turned us into a nation of people who are obsessed with cars, we've never gotten over that. Uh, to some degree, the, the, the West and the whole world, I think, is going to go through a period of computer infatuation, and no one knows if we're ever gonna come out of it. There is a digital revolution taking place, and the digital technologies are impacting us on many, many different levels. They're changing the way we do business. They're changing the way we live. They're changing the way we think about our relationship to other people. I wonder if we won't get to a point where we literally can't function without the chip, without the implant without going home and plugging in each day and updating yourself. And that's, that's where I think our evolution is heading at the moment. Computers won't be so prevalent in the sense that we now have to sit down and squint into a flickering screen and worry about carpal tunnel syndrome and, you know, bad radiation that renders us all sterile. You know, I think that um, they will recede into the background in a way that, you know, there's 
numerous computers in your car, but you're not aware of them. And I think that's what's going to happen. And I think what's left is how they've changed the way we communicate. Computers are not typewriters. Computers can create a place, an inhabitable environment where mind can meet other mind. They're more like the telephone than the typewriter. A computer that isn't hooked up to anything uh, is being misused as far as I'm concerned. I mean, the, the computers are there to be connected with one another and, and to create the neurology of the world. What does it mean to be wired? When you moved from a typewriter to a personal computer, we would refer to that as getting wired. Wired is really about communications. When hotels have data ports like this fine Sheraton, we're more apt to stay there. Getting plugged in, being connected, the global village. As long as you've got a modem, you're part of the community. The internet itself is probably the the largest working anarchy that's ever been devised on planet Earth. Down with law. Down with order. Down with everything and everybody. The way a computer bulletin board system works is that lots of people can use the same line to communicate their ideas. You can actually chat, just by chat, I mean, you know, typing in words on your keyboard in real time, which means that you will watch the letters scroll across the screen, or you can read something and then what's called post, you make a response to it, and then, you know, someone will post after your post and respond to what they said and so on and so forth. So it's like reading a little history of a discussion of a particular topic. Right now you have this culture of people who are just really excited, and they use their computer two, three hours a day just to communicate with other people. But that's sort of like going to parties for two or three hours a day. With cyber culture, it's, it's not so much using computers as a way to... Uh, communicate better with people. It's more like using computers as a way to get high. As a way to have altered perceptions of reality. It's clear to me, as someone who spends a lot of time in cyberspace and a lot of time in the real world, that these are very different states of mind. You sit down and you plug into the net and there are people all over the world and you can talk to them all night long. I, I've been living a good chunk of my life in cyberspace now for about five years. And a lot of things have happened to me there. You know, I, I had a, a, a long, tragic love affair that was almost entirely in, in words. Uh, I, uh, I've had uh, terrible fights with people that I had no particular disagreement with, really. People get just as emotionally invested in their online personas as they do with their relationships in real life. What's lost is not feeling that warm body, you know? The good thing about it, the luxury of it, is that you never, ever, ever have to uh, introduce uh, a new relationship to your mother. I was afraid something like this would happen. This to me is a blessing in disguise. So how is your new chip? That's what she'll say. Is she Jewish? Is she chip Jewish? She'll always pick on something. Well, who loves your mom? But you'll never see, you can't come to the way, you know why? Because it's in a little box. <laughs> Any relationships that I, uh, that I have uh, with women are almost I think without exception, augmented by computer. I end up, uh, if I'm involved with someone, getting them online. I've seen people commit suicide online, in a sense. I mean, I, I had a friend who, uh, who decided that he was going to kill himself, and the first thing he did was to go into the computer conferencing system that he basically lived in and set loose a program that, that systematically went through the whole conferencing system and, and erased everything that he'd ever said. And then he killed himself. I have uh, two of my closest married couple friends uh, both met uh, completely over the net and flirted over the net and built their whole relationship over the net and went for a very long time and very, very far 
uh, before they ever met face to face. These are relationships that are based entirely on uh, wit, intelligence, uh, demonstrated through writing, as opposed to uh, looks and smells demonstrated through hair care products. It's real love on a computer. Tonight, my new boyfriend from New York is, is coming in, and we met online. So, like, what, what a cyber example, right? I, cyber goddess, meets, you know, love boy online. <laughs> now, a lot of people experiment with being uh, someone of the other gender. A woman can log on and be a man, or a man can be a woman, or you could pretend to be gay or straight or whatever. It can be shocking and surprising if you're not prepared for it. But also, I think that there's a good side to that. People see how they are treated when they are perceived to be a person of the other gender. You get people sending what are called flames, which are, are just nasty messages uh, on the computer network. They probably would not have the nerve to say to you face to face. So there's this lowering of inhibitions that the communications media brings to it has both positive and negative benefits. And we need to understand both of those. If I want to punch you in the nose, the nice thing about an experience is that I can punch you in the nose. If I'm dealing with you 3,000 miles away and all I got is words, uh, I'm going to do my best to punch you in the nose with words, and that involves, you know, shrieking invective. People who pick their nose in a car, they feel they're invisible and they can pick their nose. People on computers, when they can ask you questions, will feel much more freed up to be meaner, I think because there won't be the civility attached with actual interpersonal contact. Where are we headed? I think in the future, we're going to need to have local, regional networks that can tell you a job information, healthcare information, municipal information, allow citizens of cities and counties and states to talk with each other about the issues that concern them. But this is also a global medium, and I think that we all need to have that global connection. I know that I have friends all over the world now that I would not have met other than through the network. This is sort of the dream of the information superhighway, and extended even more where everybody would be able to plug in and have like a virtual reality interface with the information net. This is sort of the, the cyberspace vision where we would all be in this shared information net talking to each other, automatic language translation, and people would have little creatures that would go out and find the information that they wanted, little virtual creatures. I would eventually believe, I would, I would suspect that in short order, you're gonna start seeing network groups that are quite they, they come up with new means of constraining their members. You know, interest groups that actually demand things of you. Probably money, beginning with money, then maybe some kind of loyalty oath or shading into weird net cults. You know, the first net Manson, the first net Koresh. Somebody who's actually able to sort of suck people into his net charisma and actually, like, force them to do things for him. We have... Uh, a lot of call for some new laws in this new territory of cyberspace. I believe that in the United States we have an excellent set of laws and rules. It's known as the Constitution of the United States, and we need to extend that to cyberspace. We need constitutional protection of freedom of speech on the computer networks, and we need uh, uh, some kind of rules that allow law enforcement to prosecute crimes without trampling the rights of individuals. What the government has proposed so far is, is something called the clipper chip, which essentially makes it possible for you to keep your communications private uh, from everybody but the government. That is to say, you would have perfectly uh, encrypted communications, but if the government wanted to see what you were up to, they would hold the keys and they could go and look. I just don't think that's a good solution. The technology will give you freedom of speech. Technology can do what the Constitution was unable to, even with the clearest wording ever written in a uh, 
in any political document. They still have managed to uh, to pollute it. But technology with encryption and high bandwidth is taking care of that. It is giving us uh, privacy and freedom that we were guaranteed by the Constitution and took, you know, boys at, in Silicon Valley and Bell Labs and MIT and Caltech to actually give us. The people who were already there in cyberspace on a conscious level are a wild libertarian lot, by and large. They're, they're people who went there just as in the last frontier because it was a place where they had a lot of freedom. Welcome to the next The cyberpunk culture started out as an underground movement, as a counterculture culture that was, in a sense, very anti-establishment, very anti-business, that was very sort of hacker-oriented, anarchistic, and so forth. It was very bohemian. The trappings of cyberpunk are, in many ways, are truly radical, are revolutionary. I'm freely and openly confessing that I am a cyberpunk, but I don't see anything wholly new about it. I mean, counterculture is a very old thing. It's as old as industrial society. Cyberpunk, you take it apart, there's two words in there. There's cyber and there's punk. And cyber means computer, having to do with the fusion of man and machines. People thinking like machines, machines thinking like people. What have I done? I certainly I always wish human beings luck. And, and uh, from what I hear about the cyberpunks and all that, is that they're, they're no more vicious than you are as a hippie. The punk aspect has to do with the counterculture. There's this sort of evolution from bohemian to beatnik to hippie to punk. And, and now I guess it would be Gen X or raver or slacker. Well, I don't control the way other people who call themselves cyberpunks behave. Uh, every bohemia has a criminal element. There are people who are into cyberpunk in a major fashion, who are into things like, uh, you know, breaking into uh, telephone switching stations, planning computer viruses, uh, stealing telephone service. There are guys there who are not healthy. I'll give you the greatest story of destruction the world has ever known. No, that's the way Bohemia always is. Computers and humans, separate but equal? One of the things that I think is happening at the, the close of the century is this increasing fusion between men and machines. Uh, machines are becoming more like people. People are becoming more like machines. This, uh, in the cyberpunk science fiction movement, that was kind of the theme that we were getting at, where you would have robots eating people's brains to get the information, or people transforming themselves into computer brains this kind of blurring of the boundary between the machine and the person. Computers never break, but they uh, become outdated. They're kind of like people. In the future, you're going to think about training them. Just the way you train a, a person or a child, you sort of tell them what to do when you give them feedback and they get better and better. And that's when it gets exciting, when instead of you adjusting to them, they start adjusting to you. I don't think a computer interface can ever take the place. I mean, you need to touch that flesh. I want flesh. It's too chilly. Computers are too chilly. I need to touch that skin. So ultimately, will it come down to us versus them? There's some dire predictions in which uh, the computers simply take over and it turns out we've built the new masters and we've become the slaves. Computers themselves don't evolve, but the stuff that lives inside them is, is highly fluid and interactive and can evolve. And uh, eventually, I think, can reach the point where it starts to control the evolution of the, of the container that, that it rises up in. Could a computer learn to program itself? What then? We're 
we're very nearly to a point where the next generation of computers may have to design themselves because we won't be able to do it. There are certain, there are certain uh, computer scientists who I think in partly because they're getting older would like to dump their brain, you know, in, onto uh, some mega disk of the future. But if you work it out in terms of the amount of information that actually has to be sent, uh, it's intractable right now. I don't think we have to worry about it for a while. One of, one of the things that computer workers sort of hope to do is to pass the torch of life, the torch of intelligence, onto the computer. It's like a, a new step of evolution almost. If machine thought, quote, exceeds human thought, then I'd rather be a machine than a human, and we might as well kind of hand it over to them. And I mean, so what? Then they'll be more human than we are, and I'd be proud to have a machine be my grandchild. Well, it's easy to get carried away with these speculations. We can say, well, DNA is information, a machine is information, we're all just information. And yet, you go outside, and you look at, like, a tree, and the bark is just so incredibly complex. You look at the sky, it's just the, this wonderful fractal textures of the clouds. The universe has been running for billions of years. We, we like to fantasize and imagine that we're going to be able to create all of this inside, uh, you know, this 40 gig metal box. And it's not going to happen. It never will happen. As long as we understand that the technology is really no more than an, an, a fancier stick to dig in the mud with, as long as we understand that we, we are the instrument, the human being, the human mind, the human heart is the instrument which uses this computer, that uses this spaceship, that uses this satellite. As long as we don't mistake our technology for us, there's a potential for a beautiful union there. But we must never forget that the human heart is at the center of the technological maze. From the Stone Age to the Information Age, human beings have made big leaps along the way. Now, as we move into the future, humans and computers are evolving together. And it may wind up that humans who can't use computers will become the new Neanderthals, left behind by evolution. Like Bogie said in Casablanca, this could be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And it's a good thing, too, because the future is where we and our computers We'll spend the rest of our lives. Tomorrow night at 8, look back as Nova uses newly available documents to reveal the Nazi architects of the death camps. Now it's the premiere of Inside the FBI. Quest is made possible by AT&T, a proud supporter of public television. Have you ever borrowed a book from thousands of miles away? You will. And the company that will bring it to you, AT&T. This program is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. This is PBS.